Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Resolution Foundation. My name is David Willits, Chair of Resolution, and I'm delighted to be welcoming here Camilla Cavendish. Uh, Camilla, who was a commentator on the Times and now writes for the Financial Times, who was head of the policy unit under David Cameron, who is now a senior fellow, research fellow at Harvard, uh, who worked on a review of care in the NHS, the Cavendish Review, and most importantly has brought out this excellent book, uh, which is available upstairs, I think with five pounds off. Uh, and we're going to hear from Camilla in a moment, and it's great that she has uh, spared the time to join us and launch her book. But as this is the Resolution Foundation, and slides are what we do, I'm just going to give you, th I, I've resisted the temptation to give you our full 25 slide, full works experience. Sure. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, but just to set the scene, we're gonna, I'm going to give you just three or four classic Resolution Foundation slides. This is the, um, the classic slide, which is the basis of my book, The Pinch, which is just showing literally how many babies were born in different years and reminds us of the size of the baby boom with those two peaks in 1947 and 1964 when we had more than a million babies born and how even at the low point in the 1950s we never had uh, fewer than uh, about 800,000 babies being born. Uh, and then uh, you can see the dramatic decline in the birth rate down to 1976. And I personally, I'm not going to give you this spiel, but I actually think that this story of the changing size of the numbers of babies actually tells you a lot about British economic and social history. You'll have to come back for the special event to go through that. But <laughs> it's relevant because it gets to the heart of what Camilla is talking about, which is the increase in the number of old people. <coughs> and that is two different phenomena which are often conflated. One thing is people living longer. And another thing is a big generation reaching old age. And, and those are two different ways in which a society can get older. It so happens that in Britain we're going through these two different effects at the same time. And we've tried to disentangle them in this slide. Now, we, it's cool because it's the conventional description, the dependency ratio. But I should apologise to Camilla for even calling it the dependency ratio. Because one of the great things about her fantastic book is we shouldn't assume that just because of age you become a dependent. And this is just an arithmetical relationship between each different age groups. It's not, it should not contain any assumptions about dependency. Um, but what this, what this tells you is that the little, the little, the gradual dotted line tells you what would happen for the increase in the number of people aged over 65 and over relative to the rest of the population just because of improving life expectancy with assuming all cohorts the same size. And then the extra curve, the more dramatically swinging around curve, is when you add to that the fact that in some years not many people were born and in other years lots of people were born. And you can see that what it does with the boomers getting older is the fact that there were so many boomers increases the dramatic shift between people aged over 65 and under 65. Um, and there are still, for example, fiscal issues from that just because there are entitlements to public expenditure triggered by reaching a certain age. But we will hear from Camilla in a moment why that isn't the full picture, not least because many people who are older are working. And this, is, uh, this just reminds us of how we've got an increase. There's a, there's a, uh, you can see how the over 65s working. And it's, we, it's a slight, it's, we've got to do it carefully because they're still at a low in absolute terms. And we, we can see that it's doubled from about 5% to over 10% in the last 20 years. So we've got an in one thing that these people are doing, as well as delivering informal care, delivering childcare, as a lot of them are actually in employment. Uh, and then finally, we've looked into, and this is a taster of some research that we're going to be bringing out in a while. This is the distribution of the population across Britain. I thought with this we've done for Camilla really, because she has these observations, some fascinating international comparison to different countries. And this is just a reminder that within Britain, we have parts of Britain with large numbers of old people. In fact, 
parts of Britain where the percentage of people aged over 65 is higher than the Japanese average. Uh, and we identified the three oldest uh, parts, of the three oldest local authorities in Britain, uh, which you can see there. And also, of course, there are parts of Britain where there are large numbers of young people concentrated. This is not the youngest three, because the youngest three are all actually in London. We've taken the very youngest, um, Tower Hamlets, uh, which has very few old people, and then the other areas that are particularly young with relatively small numbers of young people. Once you move outside London, two examples, Manchester and Nottingham. Uh, and over time, we're going to have more places <coughs> with increasing proportions of people aged over 65. So that is your taster, just on what the demographic background is, what ageing is, and how Britain is uh, ageing. But it now gives me great pleasure to invite Camilla to uh, talk about her new book, Extra Time. And uh, then I will ask a few questions of Camilla. We'll have a sort of discussion just to set the ball rolling. And then, of course, it'll be over to you to put your comments and questions to Camilla. Camilla, over to you. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I don't know whether that's a relief to some people. Um, I just got off a plane from LA last night, so I didn't have uh, time for slides, but um, David's slides are so excellent that perhaps they will serve as backdrop. Um, and, and just to pick up on what you said, David, about the demographic trends, um, absolutely, people are getting older, and there are more of them, which your slide showed very well. I mean, the other phenomenon that people often forget about is falling fertility. And um, one of the things that's completely fascinating is the fact that in almost every country outside sub-Saharan Africa, women are turning away from motherhood from a whole, for a whole variety of reasons. And I've interviewed a lot of women in different countries for the book, trying to kind of find some pattern. Um, but what's the result of a, a series of individual decisions is a catastrophic collective fall in the birth rate. Now, as an environmentalist, I actually think that's quite a good thing. Um, but clearly it plays directly into all the work the Resolution, Resolution Foundation is doing in the Intergenerational Commission because it means that the ratios are changing much faster than we anticipated. And if you look at the geopolitics of that, which is something I look at in the book, China is actually growing old before it gets rich. And that has profound implications potentially for China's relationship with the US and other countries. It also puts immigration into a very new kind of focus because one of the things I predict is that we're going to see um, a change from hostility to immigration in a series of countries to some countries, particularly in Japan, which has historically been very, very reluctant to admit immigrants. A number of economists in Japan have said to me, you know what, by the time we get round to it, it'll be too late because everybody else will be begging for those people to come in. So that's a little bit of a backdrop um, to all of that. Now, you know, you mentioned the word old several times, and I suppose part of what my book is trying to explore is what do we mean by old? Um, when I got to Harvard a year and a half ago, with the idea of researching some of this, I mean, my view was very much a, a doomy, gloomy one, actually, and I with all my background in health and care and so on, I was sort of thinking I was going to be looking at all the devastating consequences of the trends we've just talked about. And one of the first people I bumped into was a guy who had been my professor when I did my master's at Harvard 23 years ago, who is now head of the senior fellows program, is still teaching, looks almost exactly the same, is just as sharp as he was, and he's 79. And, you know, that's just an anecdote. But the truth is that we still, particularly those of us in the media, refer to the David Attenboroughs and the Mick Jaggers and the Queen and so on as, as, as marvellous exceptions. And the actual reality is that we have got people living through an extended middle age. And this is why I called the book Extra Time, because I think we haven't appreciated that for a very large group of people, and I'll come on to the ones for whom that does not apply, they have a different horizon that they haven't expected, we haven't expected. Um, if you look at the IFS work on how long people expect to live, 
most of us massively underestimate it. We think about, well, when did Granny die? If we want, we don't think about it at all, but if we do think about it, we think, when did Granny die? And we therefore quite often lose 10, 15 years um, off our calculation, which as anybody in the insurance industry or the pensions industry will tell you, or the savings industry, um, has unfortunate consequences. And one of the reasons I wrote this book, um, I started writing it very soon after my father died, and I started reflecting on the role that age had played in his life. And he was terrified of getting old. Um, and he was so worried about it. At the age of 50, on his 50th birthday, he said to me, well, I think it's all over. And he kind of lived that way for the next 36 years, which were lived in remarkably good health. My family have very good constitutions. We're very lucky. And one of the terribly sad decisions that he made, this is a tiny thing, but he decided after my mother left him and the most hotly disputed thing in the divorce was our cats. The cats went with my mother. Um, he decided not to get cats because he thought, well, you can't have a cat because I might die and then what would happen to it? And he could have had a, several cats <laughs> in the time that it took. Anyway, that's just part of why I wrote this book because I became really concerned about the way that age becomes a barrier. And I think we increasingly, in our society, we fear old age, we obsess about old age long before uh, we need to. So what I wanted to do in this book was to look at what different countries are doing about these challenges. Um, so it's trying to be an international book. I mean, obviously, I went to Japan. I went to the Netherlands, Germany. I, I, I've done a lot of the work in America. and. Um, I think essentially what you unsurprisingly discover is that most of these countries face common challenges. The UK and US have a particularly interesting situation with life expectancy at the moment, which we can talk about later if you want, where, you know, partly because of obesity, those two countries are facing a serious challenge in life expectancy stalling. But a number of countries have come up with, with different approaches and solutions to some of the problems, which I thought might shed some light. So. Um, I can't actually see a clock, and you, will ju you can just tell me to shut up when, when we've got to time. Got it. Um, but I, I just want to talk about a, a, few, a few of these things. And I suppose, you know, you go to Japan, and the great statistic is that in 2013, more nappies were sold for incontinent old people than for babies. This is the kind of desperate, gloomy statistic that fills you with horror. Um, yes, that may be true, but the fact is that Japan has done more than many countries to attack this issue quite seriously because, of course, it's further ahead than the rest of us. And the fact that life expectancy is going up, I think, the, I think Japanese women live to 87 on average now, which is the longest in the world, but, of course, many of them live beyond 100. The fact that life expectancy is going up does not mean that we're ageing as fast as we think. And there's work now being done by the UN to look at actually, you know, characteristic equivalent ages. Instead of starting at birth and working through, let's start from the other end and work back. And some of the most interesting work is being done on by the people who say, look, the World Health Organization says that old age is at 65. Um, Europe, on the whole, says that old age is at 65. You know, we're all moving towards 65 as, a, as our pension age. And, but if you take the view that old, you don't get old until you've maybe got 15 years or less, or less left to live, and you work back from that, then a lot of people are not old until their mid-70s or even older. And the work being done in Vienna suggests that if you correlate that to people's health, that actually makes a lot of sense. So we do have this extended middle age, and the Japanese call it young old, very sensibly. And they don't really regard anybody as old, old until they're at least 75. And I've talked to several gerontologists there who say, well, we're just not worried about the young old. I mean, that's no longer an issue. If you look at grip or walking speeds or anything, th those people are totally different. And, you know, there's loads of stats that I'm sure you're all aware of on that. And my objective in this is I'm not crazy about living to 100. You know, I don't mind. I've got there's some very interesting work on super centenarians. And if you live to 105, actually you almost get to sort of escape velocity from death because actually, weirdly, your risk of mortality starts to decline, which is, all of that is fascinating, <laughs> completely fascinating. And there are people in Silicon Valley who I've interviewed who, you know, are all working on escape velocity and they think if we just keep going long enough and we keep taking the right pills, we'll kind of get there. That's not really my interest. My interest is I wouldn't mind living longer, but I'd like to check out as fast as possible. 
And my real interest is in you know, reducing what, what doctors call morbidity. Can we reduce that period of senescence at the end of life, which is actually what is crippling so much of our health systems, so much of our care systems, and, and this is just not something that any of us want to look forward to. And healthy life expectancy, therefore, really matters. And I think the UK in the grand challenges on healthy ageing, you know, you've got a concept of healthy life expectancy, which is great because very few governments are looking seriously at this. But if we're going to look seriously at it, we have to measure it differently. Um, at the moment, all of those numbers are based on surveys which people fill in, which is about how do you feel? And actually, it turns out that old people particularly are really bad are telling you how they feel. And a lot of people say, well, you know, my knee hurts and I've got terrible arthritis and I can't get to the shop, but actually I'm fine. You know, so, so there's a whole, it, it, that we, we need to really, really, if we're going to take this agenda seriously, we need to change the data, we need to use clinical data and outcomes data, which will allow us to properly track our population. And then I think there are a number of things we can do to attack it. And, and just so that you know, I know this is a very savvy audience and you're probably aware, but I mean the divergence now in life expectancy and healthy life expectancy, particularly in the US and UK, is shocking. And, you know, the work that Raj Shetty has done at Stanford suggests we're looking at about 15 years difference in life expectancy between different parts of the... I mean, it's interesting looking at your, you know, your regional stats because, of course, what you'll find in this country is there's about eight years difference between some of those north, northern areas and the southern ones. Um, those things are actually more correlated with education than they are with income, which we can, we can come back to. But essentially, you know, we have a situation where the richest third of Britons, according to research at Manchester, and now only just beginning to experience some of the functional limitations that the poorest third has already started to experience at the age of 70. And that is, to me, unacceptable, and it should be one of the big social justice causes of our times. And the great thing is that some of it is avoidable. So um, David and I just started talking about whether we exercise enough earlier. Um, you know, having read the research on this, I mean, I am astounded I didn't believe all this stuff about sitting as the new smoking and so forth. Actually, I'm afraid I'm now, you know, I'm actually wearing one of these. Finally, finally bought one. Um, you know, some of, some of what we need to do, we know when there's really robust research on it. And if we exercise properly and we diet properly, we eat properly, you know, we can actually reduce the incidence of dementia. And part of this is simply a communications issue. The Alzheimer's Society will tell you that most, the vast majority of people think that if you live long enough, you get dementia. But that's just not true. And a lot of the work that the Lancet Commission and others have done shows that lifestyle choices make a huge difference. Now, the people who seem best able to make those lifestyle choices tend to be highly educated. And there's a number of reasons why that might be. They also tend to be richer, clearly, and they have the luxury of the, making those lifestyle choices. I was in Pennsylvania recently looking at a wonderful project run by Geisinger, which is a health system in, in the States. They have something they call a fresh food pharmacy, where they're prescribing food to diabetic, highly diabetic people. And those people are in food deserts. I mean, I think for years people have asked wh whether there can really be food deserts. Well, in Pennsylvania, there really are. So there, there's a whole lot of things on that side of the ledger that we might be able to do. Um, Japan is, is really exciting. I mean, between 2013 and 2016, Japan increased healthy life expectancy by a whole year for the average man. And that's right across the socio-demographic picture. That is not just for the educated rich, um, who, you know, in most other countries, they're happily gaining because they're all running in parks and, you know, doing yoga. Um, in Japan, they are beginning to crack it because they have a very targeted series of detailed programs for everything from salt intake to how many steps you walk a day and you know culturally I think Japanese people are more more willing to accept that and they're more willing to be self-reliant but I think there's a lot that that we could learn we could learn from that and as the author of the government you know sugary drinks levy I sort of think that was a good start but we need to go a lot further um, just a word on employment, which David mentioned, um, clearly there are a lot of people in this extended middle age who are unretiring. So one in four Brits now unretires after having officially retired and goes back to work. 
Some for financial reasons, some because they say they miss the structure, they miss the camaraderie, and I think it's probably to do with what I said earlier, which is they've been sort of thinking about a rosy old age coming at them fast, and then they wake up and realise that actually uh, maybe it's another 30 years. That's very encouraging. Um, Personally, I don't believe in the lump of labour fallacy. I do think that all the data shows that the more employment you have for older people, the more employment you have for younger people, on the whole, with some exceptions in some regions. And in the States, um, there are some places where it's, you know, it's more obvious in the States it's very hard to get work. But on the whole, um, the two things, they don't, it doesn't have to be a gener an intergenerational problem. It can be a benefit. And I'm not going to say very much about it. There's been a lot of good work done on ageism and so on. But one thing I have noticed, particularly in America, I've sat on a lot of panels with wonderful lobbyists and campaigners for older workers. Or well, two things I've noticed. One is that the data on older workers starts at 50. There are some great companies here which have, are targeting the over 50s, Aviva, I think Boots has done it, co-op, they, 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 it's great. They've, they've set targets for recruiting more over 50s into their workforce. Over 50 isn't that old. And Aviva, in fact, changed its adverts because it realised that it was trying to attract people and everyone in the advert was young and smiling, so they put somebody old and smiling in the advert, and that made a big difference. Um, but I'm just a bit, I've been a bit alarmed as I've gone round, you know, to find that 50 is the, is the sort of cut-off point. And the other problem I think we have is that well-meaning campaigners against ageism very often reinforce this notion that people over 50 are different because they say things like everyone must have flexible work. I mean, there was a parliamentary committee, select committee that said this last year. Everybody over 50 must be offered a flexible work contract. Well, when you sit down with employers, as I've done, that's yet another one of the things that makes them highly unlikely to hire somebody over 50. Yes, of course, once somebody's in the workforce, if they've got caring responsibility, you know, you make that decision as an employer. But I think we just have to be a bit smarter about the way in which we portray this problem. And I think you, David, at a different event, I, I remember you saying that you thought there was a, a certain, you didn't use the word hypocrisy, but I think you felt there was a certain hypocrisy in people who complained about, you know, not being able to get jobs who were already taking pensions and free bus passes and everything else. And I mean, there, there, we do have a problem with this, which comes back to our difficulty and our confusion about what old means. Um, related to the workforce issue is obviously education. Now, one of the things that disappointed me in my travels around the world is that we have done very little to advance what's often called lifelong learning. And if you remember in Britain, we had those individualised learning accounts, which weren't very successful. And when I met the Singaporeans, the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore, I got him into number 10 a couple of years ago, and I said, he's doing a really great programme called Skills Future, which will give people vouchers to take all sorts of courses forever with no age limit. And I said to him, oh, did you ever look at, you know, the Britain's individualised learning accounts? He said, oh, yeah, of course, we looked at that and made sure we haven't made the same problems. Very, very Singaporean. Um, now, they have a lot of money, as you all know, and we probably could not write that kind of blank check in this country. But something that I think um, is worth looking at, we do create great lifelong learning programmes for people who are already really smart and really educated. MITx, where I'm at at Harvard, MITx is a great programme. If you've got a million degrees already, you can come back. One of the things that I feel passionately about, and through the work I did with care workers in the Cavendish Review, was that we have a whole host of middle-aged people, often women, who didn't do well at school the first time around. Those are the people who are not networked. They can't get jobs. They can't get back into the job market after they lose their job at 55 or 60. And those are the people we need to figure out. How are we going to give them the confidence and the new skills? Andy Haldane has talked about a multiversity, which I think is a really interesting concept. The Open University is doing some work. But something that, um, David, you wrote about in your book, A University Education, your most recent book, um, you talked about neuroscience and you talked about what you called early years determinism, which is our tendency to invest in early years um, without necessarily looking at the outcomes. Um, what is happening in neuroscience is really exciting. We have discovered not just that the brain remains plastic throughout life, but that you can incorporate those new brain cells into the functional circuits of the brain if you do certain things. And I won't go into it. I've looked at lots of brain training in the book, most of which is nonsense. But there are some things that work, and they are about 
serious struggle, unfortunately. They're all things that none of us really want to do. There's some um, programs on things like speed processing and so on that, that really work. And there is some research coming out of Cambridge which suggests that older people learn differently to younger people. They use different parts of their brain. They use the posterior part of the hippocampus, which tends to decipher patterns. It doesn't just rely on memory. And that is very early research which is beginning to suggest that basically our obsession with memory and the fact we can't find our door keys um, may be underestimating the potential of many older people to keep learning. Um, right, I'll just, can I just say a couple of other things? Um, a lot of the research shows that purpose and the social connection that purpose brings is incredibly important to whether you age well or not. Now, purpose is allied to work. Clearly, if you like your job and you're, you enjoy the, the office colleagues, you will do a hell of a lot better to stay in that job. That's what most of the experts believe. Um, but purpose can be found in many other ways. Um, Japan has a wonderful group of silver centres which employ older people part-time. They can't say that they're paying them wages because the Japanese government remains allergic to employing anybody officially over the mandatory retirement age. It's all quite complicated. But actually what it does is it provides people up to the ages of 101 mm -hmm. with gainful employment and a sense of connection and a sense of connection to their local area. And I suppose what all that strikes me really is that we increasingly have gaps. I mean, when you're in government, you're constantly confronted with shortages of skilled teachers, skilled nurses, social workers. I chair Frontline, which is, uh, some of you will know, is, is the social work equivalent to Teach First. You know, we are constantly faced with gaps. And actually, I think if we stopped thinking about some of these jobs as young person's jobs, Lucy Kellaway's done a great uh, job with Now Teach, for example, and we started to get older people back into those workforces, some of them part-time, some of them through voluntary things like Help Force, um, we could make a big difference to public services. And not just on the sort of voluntary, you know, one hour a week side, but actually properly embedding them. And there's something called Experience Corps in the US, which has done that quite effectively in schools. And by the way, Experience Corps has shown that the older people that got involved in that programme improved their cognitive abilities at the same time because that programme was designed with the help of neuroscientists to do that. Um, two more things, if I can. Is that all right? I just want to talk about the old, old, because this book is not an entirely rosy sort of picture of the world. Um, we clearly have the young old, and we are still going to have the old, old for a long time, even if we do all the things I would like to do on preventative health and getting rid of a lot of chronic disease. Um, we've got to look after people properly, and we've got to deal with this prolonged senescence, and there's no clear demented drug coming down the track anytime soon. Um, we can maybe talk in discussion about Damien Green's and your social care policies. I mean, I've looked at the Japanese and uh, German policies in the book, and I think, I think there's a lot we can do there, and clearly we need to do, and I think there's a bargain to be struck uh, with the older generation on that, because I think actually the insecurity that comes from not having a proper social care system uh, is, is really cutting into people and it will make them more willing to look at the kind of payments that we, we're all talking about. But one thing I did want to mention is um, a wonderful scheme called Burtzog in Holland. I mean, one of the things we don't do well in this country is looking after people, is using qualified nurses to look after people. We have, obviously, we have our, you know, huge gap between social care and health. Burtzog is a very simple concept. It takes the bureaucracy out of care. It sends qualified nurses into people's homes so that you don't see 125 different faces. You see three. And by the way, its overhead is 8%, not 25%. And I'm happy to talk more about that. Some people are trying to bring books onto the NHS, and they are failing. And they are failing because we are too bureaucratic. We don't understand a scheme that can possibly have overheads that are so low. And I think that says a lot about the problems with our system. Um, I guess the last point I should probably make, we, I made a programme 10 years ago for which I interviewed David on Radio 4, and it was called Generation Hexed, which was a title the editor was rather keen on. Um, and it was just when you were thinking about the pinch and you were just beginning to think about those issues, and it was all about 
um, the whole point about you know, the baby boom, all the baby boomers sealing the future. And clearly, the direction of transfers in many countries is going the wrong way. In the oldest countries, the old are simply taking more out than they will pay in. And the, 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 the challenge that you have identified at the resolution is absolutely the right one. How can we provide a decent old age without bankrupting the young? That is absolutely fundamental. Um, the one nuance I, I would add into that before we stop is, I think the new divide is not just between the old and young. Um, the Centre for Aging Better has done some great work showing that 12% of over 65s are what they call struggling and alone. We still have pensioner poverty. I mean, yes, if you take out housing costs, the average income of pensioner families is now above working families. And that's a massive change. But we still have people in poverty and we mustn't pretend that they're all the saga generation. But the new divide is, yes, between old and young, but also between skilled and unskilled. And what we're doing is we're passing down housing wealth from the wealthy to the wealthy of all ages. And it seems to me that we have to have a much shrewder conversation, really, about how are we going to help the less networked and the less skilled at all ages? Because those are the people that are losing out in the fourth industrial revolution. Those are the middle-aged women, some of them whom are carers, who can't get a job, who fall out, who don't have an opportunity to reinvent themselves and get new skills. And what I've observed is just how strong the networks are of older, richer people who may be made redundant, but they can go back as a consultant and they can get a job tomorrow. And one of my students at Harvard said something which really resonated with me. He said, well, you know, my dad, you know, left his firm and he came back as a consultant. And he said, but Barbara on the front desk, you know, she didn't get to come back. And I thought that is absolutely part of this problem. And we need to look at that seriously. We need to use what we can use, what we can build on from neuroscience. Otherwise, we're going to find that all of our discussions about how we transfer wealth are going to change in discussions about another generation of old people who are not to be as wealthy as the ones we've got now. Thank you very much, uh, Camilla. Very interesting. And uh, you tell the, told the story of your father not having, take, not getting any more cats. Yes. Because um, he thought he wouldn't live long enough. As we are both members of the House of Lords. Perhaps I can, <laughs> there's a House of Lords version of this, told by uh, Charles Duro uh, when he uh, was the son of the Duke of Wellington, who was interested in conservative politics and was going round the, the, the same network to try to get selected as a Tory candidate as his friends, contemporaries, John Major, Chris Patton, through the 70s and early 80s, until he got the difficult question, you are the son of the Duke of Wellington, and uh, it, when your father dies, would you renounce the title? And he thought, you know, the Duke of Wellington is quite a sort of title in British history. And he, so he would say to them, honestly, no, in those circumstances, I would inherit and become the Duke of Wellington. And they thought, this is all just too risky. We can't have, we don't want a by-election. So he never became an MP. Uh, and his father, the Duke of Wellington, died aged 99 in 2014, <laughs> um, having lived for almost half the entire period since the Battle of Waterloo. Good God. Um, and uh, Charles always cites this as an example of exactly the same phenomenon. <laughs> Uh, I just would like, it was a fascinating presentation, Kimberly. Let me just ask two or three questions, then yep. I can see there are lots of people in the audience who want to join in as well. Mm. But first of all, your book is a kind of combination. It's, it's, a, it's, it's halfway between it's a self-help book. We have all got to exercise. We've got to do our diets. We've got a list of things like that. It doesn't have anti-aging cream, so I just said It doesn't that. have any. Uh, <laughs> it has got a bit, and I thought, and good for you, it has got a bit of uh, genetics in it. You are not dismissive of some of these amazing things happening mm. on the West Coast of America. Uh, but so it's partly a kind of self-help book. But of course, you're also interested and in been involved in public policy, uh, not least as head of the policy unit. So when you look, can we look at it briefly through the frame of public policy? What would be at the top of your to-do list for the public policy in the UK, which you think requires reform? Gosh, put me on the spot, don't you, David? Um, there's so many things. I mean, well, let, let's, address, let's address it from, from the lens you're looking at it. I mean, the self-help versus, you know. I think for me, um, 
moving towards prevention in our health system is absolutely fundamental because with the onset of comorbidities and chronic disease, we have to have more, I mean, we do have to be more self-help and we do have to take more responsibility for our own health. But it's easy to say and quite hard to do. Um, I mean, looking around the world, every government has the same problem. Prevention is always the Cinderella, you know, it's sort of always the thing that you cut. It's harder to quantify, the benefits are longer term, the outcomes are less clear, it doesn't hit the bottom line of any department. Um, and I know Matt Hancock has begun to talk a bit about this. I think it's absolutely fundamental that we find a way to quantify outcomes and start to invest more in preventative health. I mean, if I can just give you an example, and technology is helping. Now, I don't mean wearables. I mean, we all talk about wearables. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, you know, if you're somebody with a series of chronic diseases and you can't get out of the house, I don't know how you feel about wearables. Um, but there is a lot of... There's a lot of techno other kinds of technology which can help. So, for example, I just met a great company who were using gaming software to help older people gain strength and balance training. So let's just think for a moment about the dividing line, right? We want to keep people one side of the dividing line. If the dividing line is the dependency threshold, and if you go through that dependency threshold and you can't get out of a chair anymore and you have to have help and you end up in a care home, it would be better to focus on keeping people this side of, the, of that threshold. Now, if we're going to do that, we need to look at falls and fractures, for example. I mean, and, and this stuff isn't glamorous, which is why clinicians really very frequently don't want to talk about it. Keeping people that side of the line, I think hip falls, something like, account for about 10% of all ambulance call-outs. Um, half the people who have a hip fracture become dependent after that point. If we wanted to keep people that side of the line, we would invest in strength and balance training at any age. This is what I'm talking about. Any age, even a 90-year-old can improve. 12-week program, these gaming software people have a brilliant thing where you basically you play a piano and you can play a note every time you stand up or sit down. I mean, it's, it's brilliant. It's, it, it uses kind of Nintendo type technology. They're not clinicians. They just thought, let's, let's improve, let's use that to improve people. And they're working with therapists. Um, dementia, there's lots of things we could do. So to keep, I would like to see much more clarity about what would keep people that side of the line. If you talk to Mio Gray at Oxford, I mean, he's evangelical about this, what he calls the fitness gap. Mm. And I think you would find that the returns on investment were very significant. Right. Thank you very much. And that leads on to, to another question, which is about education. You touched on it in your talk. Mm. And of course, um, we know you, many of the distinctions you draw in your book are between, and including understanding greater life expectancy between people who are educated and people oh. who are unfortunately less well educated, mm. who have far worse health outcomes. I have a soft spot for the individual learning accounts. My view was that the individual <laughs> learning accounts, of course, the Treasury said they were a terrible scandal, and there was, certainly was some, there was some fraud. Yes. But actually, I think what happened when David Blunkett brought those in was that demand was greater than the Treasury expected. So the fact there was some fraud was very useful in enabling them to close down a programme that was proving dangerously popular. Um, well, and the model, the who, who uh, through that through. And, and the model of the individual learning account, I think, is is one. It, it, it certainly, I think, is worth looking at again. But what what would you've, you? And one of the great strengths of this book is that it's absolutely not a UK book. You've been to Japan. Yeah. You talk about the US. You talk about Holland a lot. Mm -hmm. um, how would you promote adult education and lifelong learning? It's a great question because for some reason adult education is always put in this ghastly, boring box, don't want to touch it. Um, first of all, I think that EQ is going to be a lot more important than IQ. Um, you know, we all, we're all aware of that, you know, doctors, AI is, is, is diagnosing better than doctors. We know that doctors therefore are going to have to move into a better bedside manner and so on. Um, I think this applies all the way through. I think caring is an absolutely classic example of that. And I suppose I've spent too much time with people in hospitals and care homes and domiciliary care workers who are regarded as not skilled because they are not academic. And I fought for a long time against the um, requirement that all nurses have a degree because I felt that that was not, you know, there, there, are, there are arguments on both sides, but I in the end felt that would exclude a lot of people who have a real vocation to care and have the kind of compassion that we want to see. And so I think we need to figure out what are the strands of EQ what do they mean? How do we teach them and how do we encourage them? Because I think there are a lot of people with empathy, with listening skills who can work. If I just give you an example from Zimbabwe, 
There's a guy, a psychiatrist called Dixon Chabanda, who was is one of a handful of psychiatrists in Zimbabwe, and he had a terrible episode a number of years ago where one of his patients didn't come to see him and he found out she'd killed herself. And when he rang her mother and said, what on earth has happened? She said, well, she couldn't afford the bus fare to come to Harare. And that was a big moment in his life because he realized I have to get out of the hospital into the community and I have to train more people to be therapists because I haven't got enough resource. And he tried quite a lot of different groups of people in the villages to be therapists. And the best people were grandmothers by far the best people. And he's now got grandmothers sitting on what they call friendship benches in I think 78 different communities in Zimbabwe. They're trained, they give you a one-to-one, -one, they give you six one-to-one -one therapy sessions. The trials they've done suggest that those grandmothers actually are more effective than standard hospital care for people who are depressed. So I just, I just think, you know, we, we talk a lot about this stuff and I would like to, us to get much more rigorous and robust in the way we think about what are those qualities and what do we need. One final question, which I'm afraid is a, is a resolution type of question, and that is about all the fiscal issue here. And it follows on from what you were saying about social care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had Damien's uh, proposals earlier this week. Yeah. And one, it's fascinating. Both you and Damien are moving to a position, I think, closer to the kind of German model where you actually say this is a classic responsibility for national insurance, social insurance. Um, the question then arises, who, if you think that there is going to have to be in some form increased public spending and you refer to the anxieties and the concerns people have who don't know how they're going to meet their social care costs and probably end up holding on to m more money than otherwise would be rational. That's true too. Yeah. Would the worry that uh, we have and that came out when we did our intergenerational commission is given that there is clearly a pattern of mm. younger people having a relatively raw deal on average there are exceptions yep. but yep. on average absolutely um and these older generations are retiring with assets houses and pensions should we assume that it's the younger working generation who pay higher taxes to make a transfer to the older generation to cover their social care costs no. Or should we instead be looking at hmm. tax proposals which fall particularly on the older generation who are going to be the immediate beneficiaries? Yes, I think we absolutely should. I mean, I think with social care, what I suppose I don't know, David, is, you know, I can't compute how much of the entire fiscal envelope is accounted for by social care. Um, and it's clearly not the whole story. Um, and you can't hit people too often in too many different ways. So you do need a coherent... You need government to look across the piece at all the benefits people of a certain age are getting and all the expenditures they have. And you also ideally would need government to take some account of the fact that, for example, older people are providing enormous amounts of free childcare and a whole lot of other things, which, which they get rightly very exercised about. But in the social care space, I mean, I have been an advocate of this for many years, really. Um, I was actually quite supportive of the 2017 manifesto on, on this in as much as it was trying to unpack a really important issue. The problem for that manifesto was, you know, you don't suddenly hit people who didn't know there was an iceberg with the news that there's an iceberg and then expect them to, to suddenly in, in a couple of days come around to your point of view. This is a long conversation. But what the Germans and the Japanese who copied the Germans did was that they abolished means testing. I mean, they kind of made a deal with the public. They abolished means testing and said, look, we're now going to create a universal system, which means that you will all have security, but we're going to ask you to pay a bit more. And that politically worked. Now, there was a cross-party consensus around this, but, you know, it took years. I mean, this is not something you can suddenly visit on people, but it does make sense. And the German system, which is very much what I'm advocating, is... And, you know, it would, in this country, it would mean, for example, charging over 65's national insurance, which seems to me an obvious thing to do. Um, the German system takes contributions from every worker over 40, yes, but twice as much from the over 65s and also from employers. And it, it does give you that sense of social solidarity. And what's intriguing to me in Japan is that I've talked to a lot of young people who say, we're never going to get a pension. I mean, all over the world, young people say, we're never going to get a pension. By the time we get that old, it won't be there. But in Japan, they say that, but they say, but we believe in the social care fund. And incidentally, 
Japan now has, I think, 15 different levels within that fund. It's actually extremely progressive. It has a co-payment system within it. It is hitting the rich a lot harder, and I think that's often not well understood, that it is becoming increasingly progressive. So I think that's a very, that's a very interesting model. Yep. yep, very interesting point. Good. That's, that's, been, that's been excellent. Now I'm going to collect interventions from around the floor. And if you could give your name and organisation, that would be fantastic. Let's start here with Jeff. Camilla, yeah. thank you very much indeed. Jeff Wilkin, um, I suppose former chair of the Centre for Ageing Better, but now actively involved in Damon Green's Initiative right. and Longevity. Mm. Um, a, a great speech, and I look forward to the book. <laughs> um, as you know, the Prime Minister um, 18 months ago set a, a great goal that we will improve healthy life expectancy by five years yeah. by 2035 and to have closed the social divide in part in the process. Yes. And Damien, as you know, and David knows, is working on an initiative to really answer the question, what requires to be done by business, by research, by investors, mm. by individuals, and by public policy? And that will be, I think, a fascinating piece of work over the next nine months. Yeah. The question is, um, as you know better than most, um, you hit two problems with that, um, that the, the agenda of issues are likely to incur initial costs uh, with later ununcertain benefits, and you know what the Treasury says about that. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it hits the problem that you also know that sometimes it confronts conventional political views. Um, look at the sugar tax and that. Mm. So how do we help the politics to um, engage and support the sort of changes that will be necessary to realise that goal? I'm going to get, and I should have said, by the way, and it's great that Jeff is here, a member of our intergenerational commission and made a fantastic input to that. Are there other people who want to ask, particularly in that area, about social care and its funding? Should we, I'm going to collect a bunch in that area. Let's take these two questions as well. Yeah. Thank you. Just wondering, uh, John Newham, um, member of the Labour Party, I just wondered, given that uh, in 2010, uh, but Labour had a few problems on this, on this issue, just as the Conservatives yeah. did in 2017, um, is the national insurance model, uh, or some variation of it, perhaps the least worst way? Because at the moment we've got this surreal situation. If I get cancer, I'm going to have the NHS looking after me. Yeah. If I get dementia, then there's a rather large bill for me or my relatives. Thank right. you. Right, and then immediately behind you. Uh, Nick Bosenket from uh, Imperial College. Thank you very much. But I'm worried about the Cavendish broad front approach uh, because, in fact, a lot of good things are already happening for the younger old and, and there are a lot, of, a lot of activities. It's not just people who are working. And on the baby boomer projection, about 20% of the over 65s are going to work with, they're going, they're going to be more highly educated. But there are still some very, very persistent, serious gaps. Shouldn't we be concentrating a bit more and the two I'd nominate is first, the complete failure to develop reablement, rehab, active mm. help with skills, life skills for people with serious health problems. Yeah. Uh, and the National Service Framework in 2001, I think it was, suggested a very good programme. Nothing has happened, basically. In fact, there's less being done mm. there. The second area in which uh, there's a very big gap still is in end-of-life care. Mm -hmm. That yeah. uh, There are some uh, developments there, are much better community services, but uh, obviously there's a great deal of fear of that, that area. Should we be concentrating a bit more uh, within the Cavendish what, what do you envelope? Mean the f what do you mean about the fear, Nick? Well, there's a fear of the, the very poor experience that people are going to have towards the end, which you, uh, right. instead okay. of... Uh, uh, a range of services we could help to uh, bring about uh, quality of life and security and control in the last phase of life. Any other interventions in this area? Uh, yes, the gentleman at the front, and then we'll turn to you, Camilla. Thanks. Simon Shaw from the Food and Farming Charity Sustain, where we've got particular interest on Meals on Wheels and the preventative mm -hmm. role they should be playing, but uh, uh, being cut quite significantly in many areas. Just in terms of the prevention argument in terms of social care, did mm. you discover particularly in other countries examples of where they have managed to have that breakthrough to actually make the case for prevention and move away from uh, the sort of problem situation we have where, say, social care saves health money and social care doesn't, say, see the benefit from that? Okay. 
Kim, over to you. Um, lots of great questions. Mm. I'm not sure. When, when you talk about the broad Cavendish front, I think you may be right. I may be not able to answer all of them. Um, on the, um, the sorry, the, Jeffrey Filkin, your question was on the, um, the great goals, as it were. I mean, I think that's very encouraging. I know what you mean about the politics. And I, I suppose with all these things, I would always fear in government that if you try to, if you try to hit too many agendas at once, you may not get anywhere, which I think is what you were possibly suggesting. Um, I do go back to what I said. I think we have to measure healthy life expectancy possible, or I don't know what we're aiming at. I mean, I do think that really is quite a fundamental problem with this. We, we really need to be very clear what we're aiming at. If you're able to measure, and that means just, you know, getting clinical data and, and using it at a quite a granular level and getting the CCGs involved to to look at that properly. And I think, you know, we have a general problem in the NHS that we don't, we still don't do enough work on value. We still don't do enough work on outcomes. And that's actually part of all of this. Um, I do think, I do think within the NHS, and that's not the whole of your question, but we could do more to reframe people's jobs. You know, if you're a knee surgeon, your incentive is to keep doing knees. If you made the knee surgeon, you know, the head of joint pain, for example, um, you, you don't have to bolt on something extra. You could reframe the way they think about their job. And I, I do think that's part of what this is about. I think, it's, I think the danger is that we will create a lot of small initiatives which kind of bolt onto things. And I think we need to get, if we can, right into the inside the institutions. I know that's only a partial answer to your question. Um, the... Yeah, the, 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 the point about is national insurance the least worse? <laughs> I mean, yes, it probably is. I, I think, look, I think there is a huge political challenge here. I mean, everywhere I've been for the last 10 years, I rate people get up in audiences, not like this, but other audiences, and they say, don't tell me I have to sell my house to pay for care. Well, you know, I've had power of attorney for four people in my life now. I've got just taken it again for another one, and the reality is you have to sell your house to pay for care. And the reality is, you know, you can't pass the house on to people. Um, and that's probably not going to change. I think we've got a problem in that we have, because we're all, we're all worried about mortality, we don't like to think about any of this stuff. The only people who are aware of these issues are people who are either old or the children of people who are old. The rest of the population has absolutely no idea. So if, and this is what happened in 2017. We suddenly said to people, oh, by the way, there's this huge problem coming at you which is going to cost you a lot of money, and people weren't ready for that. So I think it, it is partly just a communications issue. But we have to have cross-party consensus. We absolutely have to have cross-party consensus. I know that's always said, and I'm not a great fan of endless royal commissions, which take 10 years and so on, but I honestly think we're not going to get anywhere unless we can somehow, and maybe part of Lord Filkin's group might, might help to do that, I mean, it somehow start to forge some sort of cross-party agreement on what the, what the... which is what the Germans did. Um, on the point about, um, your point about making the case for prevention, I mean, I think Japan is really the only place I've seen which is properly doing that. And again, as I said, it's partly the burning fat platform problem. I mean, if you've suddenly got just a vast number of older people, some of whom are very frail, you really have to start looking at it seriously. And they just, I would advise you, look at this Healthy 21 Japan initiative. I mean, they have, it's really, really detailed. And they have targets for everything. And I think they're slightly more top-down in their approach. I mean, it's done through local government, but clearly I think there is a slightly different culture in terms of what people are prepared to accept. But they are really focused on that. And as I said, I think there's a lot we can learn. And I've left out a question about end of life and reablement. I mean, I don't know about the reablement programme. It sounds brilliant. I don't know why we haven't done anything you know better than me. We should do it, shouldn't we? Yeah. Does it cost a lot of money? No. No, well, that's the thing, yeah. You see, I think, and you're a clinician, aren't you? So. Um, I thought you were a clinician. Okay, you're not a clinician. <laughs> if there are any clinicians in the room, apologies, but I have talked to a lot of clinicians now in many countries. Nine out of ten doctors in the US and UK have never raised the issue of somebody's weight, ever. So they will give you a pill for backache, but they will not refer to the fact that you're overweight. Clinicians are very reluctant to intervene in those things. There are many reasons why. People are nervous. They don't believe anyone will lose weight and so on. But I think we need to make this stuff more glamorous. I'm really sorry. I think doctors absolutely love, they love all the stuff about genomics, they love the stuff about new oncology drugs, you know, and there's a lot of that in my book. We've got to get them focused on the things that 
really make a difference. The 20 second conversation that Susan Jebb has pioneered at Oxford really makes a difference to people. And that's cheap. So let's try and, you know, let's try and do that. I think Nick was also proposing a kind of social contract. He was saying that there are things that old people themselves worry about and need mm. to expect to have addressed through public policy initiatives. And if we want them themselves to contribute more, there has to be something directly they can see. This is helping pay for services that they right, fair enough. Okay. Which I think yeah, was a, I think is, and it's partly what's behind Jeff's questioning as well. <laughs> I think is a is an important part of this. Yeah. Right. Now let's collect some more interventions. So at the back there. Of us who've been arguing this for 30, 40 years, slightly wearily. Yeah, well, I hope in the book you say how far backwards we've gone in this country in the last 10 years. Mm. But I was a little surprised that you immediately went on to reference point was middle-aged or young old women and their need to form networks. Now, women are now at every age below about 65, much more highly qualified than Men are, they do better in education, and I can assure you they return to education in much greater numbers. I was chair until recently of the Working Men's College, which now has 75% mm. women. Uh, <laughs> and the same would be true of pretty well every adult education institute. So I put it yeah. to you, actually there's a reverse problem. The, the problem is about male participation and yes. how to get them in, David's question and how you promote it. The problem with women is how to get the competencies that they have mm -hmm. recognized mm -hmm. in the workplace so that they can carry on doing it, not about getting them back in. They're ready enough to come back in. Right, you pass, pass that along to David, and then, mm -hmm. Becky, we'll have a couple of questions on this side as well. Yeah, um, yeah thanks. Um, David Goodhart, my name. I'm, I work at another think tank up the road. Um, uh, we're slightly facing in opposite directions on education, I think, in this debate. On the one hand, well, it's, it's sort of academic, sort of cognitive um, uh, uh, education. On the one hand, the more educated people seem to be the, one who are, who, the ones who are benefiting from extra time and so on. And so, you know, therefore, one might want to send as many people as possible to university as David wants to do. On the other hand, a society which places sort of too much stress on cognitive ability ends up diminishing mm -hmm. uh, other kinds of aptitude like the caring function um, that, that you were mentioning, mm. uh, Camilla. So, so how, how, do we, how do we sort of square that problem? And then uh, the lady there and the gentleman in the centre, then we're after those four questions to him. Uh, the lady there, and then we will come back to you, Camilla, yes. Gabrielle from Centre for Social Justice. I was wondering if you had a specific recommendation for the state pension age, whether you had um, an age in mind that would maintain a financially viable dependency ratio. Thank you. And then the gentleman by the door there. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for that. That's fascinating. My name's Ray. Uh, I run a company called Unmortgage, which is a new way to buy a home without a mortgage. Um, I want to talk about technology and community. Um, Things like Facebook, WhatsApp, and Amazon have brought general benefit to people's lives. But the rapid decline of the high street mm -hmm. has robbed people of the proximity of mixing with other people yeah. and having the inspiration and drive to, to walk somewhere and interact with different parts of the population. And I believe there's fundamental errors in government policy around not investing in, but also fundamentally destroying the high street when you say you can have permitted development rights to destroy the high street forever. It, does, that, does that factor in anywhere? Very good. Some questions about education, some questions right. about networks, questions about pension age. Okay, so, um, sorry, I didn't mean to confuse the lifelong learning debate with women. I mean, and I'm fascinated by what you said about the, um, the Working Men's College. I, I, it was more that I come from a place of just having met a lot of brilliant women who can't get ahead and so I feel very strongly about them but I mean I totally accept what you say about men and I also think um, you know it's about confidence and about skills and I have interviewed a lot of men who have lost their jobs in their 50s who simply cannot get back in 
and it's very clear that if you're out of work for more than two years, you, you really can't get back in. And employers, actually, some research suggests they would rather hire someone who's got no experience at all than someone, and it often is a man, who has been out of the workforce for two years. So I totally accept what you say. I don't know what the answer is, but we clearly have to just get much better at understanding how to communicate with those people. There are, there are some co-working spaces. Uh, there's one in Wales whose name I'm afraid I can't remember, but which are beginning to develop co-working spaces and, and help to try and get people back into the labour force. I, I, think there's, I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, David, your point, yes, I, 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 we are perhaps facing in two different directions. I mean, I think we probably would say that we're, we want to do both, don't we? I mean, you want to encourage everybody to do more learning. You've just got to be very subtle about what the learning is. Um, and I mean, I think you and I, you know, we've talked before about, I mean, clearly that the stress on the kind of cognitive ability that we have previously been used to talking about may not be as relevant in this coming world. And we, we've got to get a lot better at thinking about that. Um, I totally agree. Um, Gabrielle, your point, yes, I mean, I, I don't think I have a particular number. There may be one in the book. I mean, clearly we need to link uh, the state pension to life expectancy. Um, I interviewed Adair Turner for the book who says in the book that, you know, he wished he'd started 20 years ago and that we're too far behind the curve. And of course, one of the things Adair said to me was, you know, when he was chairing that pensions commission, I mean, the actuaries used to come in and they used to come in with the same graph and the graph would keep showing life expectancy tailing off all the time. And it kept, you know, they kept moving the, you know, it kept going up further and then tailing off. And eventually he said, well, why do you keep showing it tailing off? And of course, they thought smoking would continue. And the thing they missed was the fact that smoking cessation has made a vast difference, not to life expectancy at birth, but to life expectancy over 65. So what you've seen between about 1970 and 2011 was that extraordinary boost, exponential change in life expectancy at 65. So over the past century, I mean, life expectancy at birth has gone up by, I think, about 30 years. It's barely budged for people over 65 until we started to challenge smoking, which is one reason I feel so passionate about challenging obesity, because for me, that is our, that is our new equivalent. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I think that there is, a, there is a sort of age at which most people agree that the danger for us is we can't keep raising pension ages forever because of the divergence in healthy life expectancy. And of course, we've now seen UK life expectancy stalling in America, partly because of the opioid problem. You've got three years of consecutive decline. And th this, is, this is really, really worrying, what is going on in these societies. And it's partly about poverty, it's partly about obesity. And com so you do have to be careful that you don't just rise pension ages and per raise pension ages in perpetuity. And you've got to be careful whether you're looking at the meat, what kind of average you're looking at, because you might exclude certain people. Um, Ray, your point about technology and community, I'm, I'm completely fascinated. I have a chapter in the book about neighbourhoods. Um, because one of the things I wanted to talk about was how we're all going to need a neighbourhood of some sort. But what is that? Um, you know, is it the conventional neighbourhood? I mean, I think some people would argue that, you know, online contact is great for people. But do they then convert it into face-to-face? -face? Um, I think we, we are going to, because of the plummeting fertility rate, we're going to have to create neighbourhoods and even multi-generational families that are not made up of relatives. You know, I mean, in Germany, they're beginning to create these multi-generational houses which are not made up of relatives because you might not have any relatives. So there's really interesting questions about who is the support network, who is the family. In Beacon Hill in Massachusetts, there's a wonderful uh, group of people who have spawned 130 other villages around the world who got together as neighbours and said, we don't want to go into care homes. We don't want to be told what to do. This is very strong, by the way, in a lot of these enterprising pioneering groups around the world. We don't want to be told what to do. We don't want those nurses, doctors, social workers telling us how to age. We're going to do it ourselves. They've created, they've, they are a neighbourhood, but they've built a much stronger neighbourhood with a series of sort of facilities. And um, I agree with you. I don't know what we do about the high street, but I'm, I'm sure that that is a vital aspect of it. And the same is true of post office. It's the same is true of the idea that we're going to become a cashless society. Um, I think we need to look at it through this lens as well. On the pension age, of course, we did... Uh when the government privatised lots of industries, it regulated them with a formula of PI minus X. And the suggestion is for pensions, mm. we have RIP minus X. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that would be, which of course in a, in a kind of way is, is what is now happening as the... That, that is sort of what we're... As yeah. the pension age slowly rises, RIP minus X. Right here first. 
Right, let's collect some in interventions yeah. from this side. Yes, the lady there, and then we'll move along to the front. Yes, thank you, Becky, yes. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to hear about the uh, intergenerational uh, communities, but the basis of intergenerational community could be much more family. And I think that we are in a situation where I remember years ago, 10 years ago, I worked for the Grandparents Association and frequently lobbied David about the issues for grandparents. Mm. Grandparents do do a huge amount of care. Yeah. Um, but I think that uh, there's a vast difference. I once went to interview a great grandmother who was looking after her great grandchild and I wanted to write a celebratory article about her. Um, she lived on the top floor of a block of flats uh, and she had very poor health. Mm. She had raised her daughter, her granddaughter and now her uh, great grandson on her own in poverty mm. was in very... And I landed up advocating for this little boy who was sat in front of the television and bouncing off the walls mm. Um, to have um, a nursery school place ahead of time because he needed that. And I think there's a vast difference. I now have the lived experience of being a grandmother and, and, and happily have the resources to be able to do this and to have been able to support my children, all three of them, to live in London. I'm very, very privileged. But we need to make it easier for people to live close to those who do care about them. And we need to also, um, having worked on a helpline for grandparents who've lost contact with family, we need to actually, I think, broker mending some of the relationships that have broken down over the lack of a thank you letter or a long since uh, yeah. argument. And I do feel that both in, in every sense, those areas of the country that have identified as some of the highest levels of older people, I will bet, mm. have a high level of people who don't live close to the younger people in their families. Yeah. Right. right, right. very important about grandparents. Yes, the mm. gentleman here, <laughs> front. I'm, I'm Brendan Martin from Bjutsug in Britain and Ireland. Thank you very Hello. much. Hello, Camilla. Oh, We've never actually met in person. Yeah. No, a delight to meet now. Um, and thank you for your very positive statement about Bjurtsog. Mm. Um, however, it's not quite true to say that we're failing in Britain. Sorry, um, I shouldn't have ever done that. I just wanted to... <laughs> however, but yes, but let me nuance that. It, what we've done so far in Britain is within NHS and other public sector organisations supported the... Um, development and creation of a few pioneer teams um, which have which have uh, some of which have now been evaluated and the evaluations have tended to confirm a lot of anecdotal evidence that we've collected which along these lines which is um, guess what if you create conditions in which frontline professionals are able to exercise their professional qualifications and their judgment and their intelligence as normal adults to create the kind of relationships with the people that they support and care for, uh, to do that in a flexible and holistic way. They love doing it, and the care and support is much better. What they also find, though, and this is the challenge we've got, is that to grow that to scale needs a completely new way of looking at organizational development yep. in, in health and social care organizations. At best, we're faced with organizations who think, oh, that's a successful pilot, we better scale it up. Mm -hmm. uh, at worst, it's, that's a successful pilot, but it won't work at scale. What we really need yeah. is to create an environment in which the professionals themselves are able to volunteer to innovate in this way. And would you like very briefly just yeah. to say exactly what you are doing in the UK for people who haven't yet read the book, just describe, and particularly now we're talking about the UK, not Holland, what is it that you, what is exactly, what is the service delivered in what way? The, well, the service is to provide health and social care to people in their homes in a holistic way that cuts across the artificial structural barrier we have between health and social care in Britain. 
and which enables the professionals through working in neighborhood teams which are self-managed without managers, supported by regional coaches or in, in the Netherlands or co other coaches that we provide here. Um, so these, all, these teams are self-managed because frankly, if you recruit people who've got the right qualifications and the right values and the right commitment and create an organization and environment in which they're able to do what they do well, you don't need to tell them what to do. But yep. we have instead, we, we confront an incredibly low trust environment, not only within the NHS and social care organizations, but frankly also, and I think this is a problem, between the government and the NHS as a whole. So my question really is, mm. I mean, I'm happy to go on talking about, about what we're doing in Britain, but I, I hope that's enough of a flavor, mm. David, for, yeah, for your yeah, question. Right. Is that a satisfactory yeah, yeah. answer to your question? Yeah. So my question to, mm. to Camilla is, mm. how do we turn this culture of low trust right. into a culture of high trust? That's a very, yeah, very good question. Now, I think we're gonna try very briefly to squeeze in any room, oh, I say, we have got a lot of, We've got a lot of questions. I don't know how. I don't know. Let's collect the, the gentleman there, and then I think we will turn back to you, Camilla. And then I, will, I see there's quite a few interventions on this side, which I'll collect in it. Hi, right. um, Charles Smart. I work on uh, social care and public health spending at the Treasury, so I feel a bit cheaper saying that. But, um, <laughs> we touched on the challenges facing health and care and employment from aging. Are there any kind of lesser known? more surprising areas which are facing a challenge from an aging population. Ah, mm -hmm. very interesting. So two questions about intergenerational relationships, really, and then that, that very interesting final one. Camilla. OK, so um, yes, I mean, funnily enough, the issue of living close, um, which is such a big issue, and in, play, in Asia particularly, where you've got young people moving to the cities to find jobs and hundreds and hundreds of miles distance away. Um, it's really acute. And in China, it's actually introduced a law to force people to visit their parents, which actually can't really be the, well, yeah, and can't really be the right answer. Yeah. But I mean, that's just how bad it's, yeah. that's how bad it's getting. My daughter is certainly not complying with that. Yeah, well, you know, it might not go down very well here. But it just it shows you the, the problem. Weirdly, I think one of the, the strange um, potential upsides of the terrible problem we've got in the sense that young, the young can't get on the housing ladder. One of the, uh, perhaps the only upside of that is that more and more people are living at home. And of course we all worry about that because we worry about the assets and the fact that, you know, the, you know people can't start a family and so on. What I, what I wonder is whether we're going to see that continue even if economies improve and, and wages improve. So there is some evidence in the States to suggest that some of those sort of multi-generational households um, are actually working quite well. And there's a developer who is now selling you, they'll sell you two houses in one for, as a two-for-one deal. They'll sell you a little house for yourself and a flat for the, for the parents, or the, re or the reverse. And I just wonder, I mean, I, it would be interesting to see if we could embed some of that um, as we move forward. It, it could, could be a positive yeah, sorry. Um, on the Butzog, I mean, we've probably taken up too much time talking about how marvellous Butzog is, but I can't recommend it highly enough. I mean, your question about the trust, I mean, clearly, you know, you went to Guy's and Tommy's, you've got one of the best chief nurses in the country there. She's amazing. Um, you know, it's much harder to penetrate the, the bulk of the NHS, which doesn't, in, which doesn't do innovation. Um, and you're completely right. I mean, how do we change the culture of, to high trust? Well, gosh, I mean, that is... <laughs> <laughs> Six million dollar question. I mean, I, I, funny enough, I'd put it almost the other way around, which is if we could get projects like Butzel to work. I mean, nurses have come out of retirement in Holland to work for this organisation because it actually gives judgment back to the front line. And it, it, it allows them to do the job they wanted to do and the reason they went into that many years ago. If we could get that working, that in itself would create trust. I mean, that's not a great answer, but I just, I just feel that is, it has got to be a part of the answer. The right answer. Yeah. Um, the, gosh, your question, gosh, classic treasury question, isn't it? Mm. It's so clever. Um, what are the unexpected? There are quite a lot. Um, I've got a whole chapter in the book on biology and genetics. Um, very briefly, I think we ought to consider treating ageing as a disease, as a treatable disease. That's a huge area, I won't get into it now. I mean, you, it, all, it sounds outlandish, but actually I think where we're getting to in some of these biological breakthroughs means we need to look at that seriously. Um, the other one is the notion of family. As I said, uh, what do we actually mean by family? And it's going to have to change. 
that's a quick answer. And if you look a long way ahead, one of the points we would make at resolution is where we are now past peak home ownership, renters entering old age and the housing benefit bill because the, yeah. the welfare state is basically modelled on the idea most people end up as owner-occupiers. Mm. And a society where people don't end up as owner-occupiers and you yeah. have ageing renters brings, uh, brings with it very significant costs. And actually the Samaritans are very worried about that. Mm. Mm. Now, there's a lot of questions. And I think with the lady there, yes, next to you, Laura, and we will try to, we will try to whiz through them as briskly as we can. Yeah. Yeah, uh, my name is Mushina and I'm an accountant. I was wondering why you chose uh, the countries that you chose to look at, uh, such as Germany, uh, Japan, and is it sort of is it complete contrast with the UK or um, the environment and the family? It wasn't as rigorous as, as as that. I mean, I was in based at Harvard doing this research, and I wanted to look at the US particularly because I think they are just more positive about things. They all think Europe's doing brilliant. If you go to the US and you say, well, "What are you doing about this?" They, and they've got some great voluntary schemes. But of course, they have a terrible health system. So they say, well, Europe's marvellous. And then you go to Europe, everyone goes, well, the US is marvellous. Um, Japan I went to because you just have to go there because they are at the forefront of this. Um, and then the other ones, to be honest, I just picked off what seemed interesting to me. Very there are good. many, many more countries I could have, I could have looked at. Very good. Gentlemen, then. Uh, John Bryant, I'm um, semi-retired now because of my own choice and therefore living on a lower income while trying to discover what retirement's going to be like when I'm fully retired. And one of the benefits that ha of working in, uh, uh, living in London is the Freedom Pass. Mm -hmm. Now, that is the biggest contributor, in my view, to improving the mental health of people, mm -hmm. probably the young old, yeah. who can get out, as long as they get to their bus stop, they can see the whole of London for free. And that is probably helping the NHS not pay out for interventionist treatments for people who have mental health problems otherwise. So do maintain either cheap or discounted fares for people to get out and other free stuff like public lectures in universities, which I go to a lot. 25% uh, yeah. of, of journeys on the free Freedom Pass are journeys to work by people aged over 60. I personally would double index. I would raise the age at which people get it in their 60s and raise the age of entitlement for young people to get free travel in return. But that's, sorry, I interviewed, I shouldn't have done. Now there's a, a couple of, yeah, lady there and then diagonally next to her. Yeah. Seat, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question is also on mental health. I'm Drew Sella Summers. Um, my day job is working for Brexit Central. I'm not going to talk about Brexit, don't worry. Um, I founded a couple of years ago Conservatives for Mental Health, so it's something that's quite important to me already. Um, but recently, my grandmother um, has been going through looking at moving out into sheltered accommodation because where she lives isn't suitable. Um, but she's terrified. She's been there about 25, 30 years. Mm. It's her home. It's all she yeah. knows. She's blind now, can't get out, can't yeah. use online devices. Um, and the problem we had was that she was offered a sheltered accommodation place. But then when they confirmed her place, they went through her rather than my aunt. And out of fear, she turned down the place and they took her off the list immediately. Um, so for me, mm. mental health support is crucial and I keep hearing about social care but nothing about mental health and mental health and social care need to be yeah. looked at together so my question is sort of how can we approach that very good and then uh, just in front of you there was another intervention yeah um, hi Rebecca Deegan from the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries um, I had a question about financial security in later life um, you mentioned that younger people are concerned about the sustainability of the state pension um, and there was a report last week from the Intergenerational Fairness and Provision Commission um, about the triple lock up rating of the state system here. Um, and also, we're still, I think, dealing with the uh, freedom and choice reforms and the transition of longevity risk to individuals and then mm. managing that themselves. Mm. So just wondered if there were any lessons from the work that you've done for this book or with your past experience um, on financial security and later life and managing that risk. Very good. And then two gentlemen, uh, we're going to try to squeeze you all in, but again, have to be brief. Yes, the two gentlemen and the lady there. Yep. Hello, uh, I'm Nick from Britain Thinks. Um, I was just really interested in the conversation you had about prevention and how set the importance of selling it to kind of 
policy makers. I was also really interested in the idea of selling it to the public as well. So mm. I'm a qualitative researcher and I've done countless focus groups and interviews talking to people about prevention and generally just the unwillingness to consider it as an option. One, because they feel that we've already got a crisis in A&Es, why would you spend money on prevention? Yeah. And two, a lot mm -hmm. of people either feel that they know it all or that they're already a lost cause. I did like in a uh, workshop with young like 16 year olds and they already thought that they were a lost cause yeah. for like prevention. Um, and so I was just wondering in your experience doing uh, d did you see any kind of ways of selling it to the public in Japan, other places, or anything about very, that? Very good. And the gentleman there? Yes, uh, I'm Antonino Juviro. Um, what has always disturbed me about generational anything is because of the vast amount of immigration we've had over the last 12 years, one generation is actually not related to the one underneath, simply because they come from elsewhere. And how does that affect all these redistributive schemes? And also, immigrants are, have, sometimes, uh, a, a different religion, different networks, hmm. and how are you taking account of that? Right, very good. And then the lady there, just, uh, yep. Hi, my name's uh, Julia randall Khan from the Centre um, of Longevity at Stanford University. And my question goes back to the question of um, social engagement and, and connection and purpose, and the issue of loneliness, um, and the impact that this will have, uh, particularly on the issues around neighbourhood and, and intergenerational connections, and any observations you've got in relation to that particular topic. Thank you. Then Becky, lady there. And then finally the gentleman there, and then we will... My name is Caroline Instance. My interest in ageing is because I have an elderly parent and I'm also involved in various age UKs. But one of my, f my question is related to the fact that I'm now involved with a local community by being a parish councillor, believe it or not. And my f total frustration of the planning system in Britain and how mm. it doesn't look at all at ageing issues. And it occurs to me that yep. we tend to box ageing population into a health and social care issue yeah. and not actually looked at all aspects of public policy. And we've blinking well got to do something about transport, climate change and housing and planning that is generating houses. I mean, they are building teensy little boxes that are they call luxury homes yeah. in the south, the south east where I live, um, forgetting about ageing and the fact you can't live in them when you're lacking mobility. And you right. know, not having yep. mixed age communities being developed. Yep. So we've yep. got to yep. do something about right. that. Right. Yep. Final question then. Hi, my name's David Sharp. I in the day I work at M and G, but I have a very simple, rather naive and perhaps rather vulgar question. Um, you touched about cross party um, collaboration. Um, given the number of choices, given the longevity of the average politician, but the longevity of the issues that we've been talking about. How do we depoliticize some of the choices that need to be made, whether it's across generations, mm. um, whether it's dealing with care, and how we use the economic resources to, uh, to answer some of these societal questions? Thank you. That's Camilla. Not, that's neither a naive nor a vulgar question, as far as I can see. Shall I start with yeah, that? Whatever, these are your final Sorry, I mean, how long have we got? Together. I'm worried, you know, I don't know what time everyone thought they were going to leave, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Look, I think the answer to that, there, there is a model which is the Adair Turner Pensions Commission I talked about earlier. Um, it seems to me that what that commission did was it took on a really thorny, controversial issue. It did really rigorous research, produced very clear stats which showed that there was a problem. Um, and there was an undeniable problem and then set up a, a series of solutions for it. I think I've just... Yeah. Um, and I, I, think that, I think you need a model like that. Um, how broadly you go is a different question. I mean, it, you clearly do need to keep it relatively tight so that you can create the, the problem to which there is a solution. But I'm afraid I think we have to do that first before we could get into any of this. And that's really what Germany did. Um, gosh, there's so many questions. The Freedom Pass, good for mental health. Yes, and a lot, number of people... Jane Bakewell said to me that she thinks the Freedom Pass is the single best thing because it brings people of all kinds together. And I thought that was just a great point. She said, well, you know, all those Jewish ladies of fur coats go on St John's Wood and then you get out. I mean, it was just brilliant, actually. So there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, there is a question about what's affordable. 
Um, David's point is right. I mean, if 25% of the people in receipt of that are going to work, one, one asks oneself, but it would be perfectly possible to tax people on their whole income, it seems to me, and still keep that free. So that's, that's, the, that's the thing we seem to, seem to miss. Um, sorry, financial security, who was it transferring risk? Um, I mean, yes, I mean, look, I'm not a pensions expert, and there are many in the room who are. It does seem to me that in terms of private pensions, it's a shame that so much risk ended up being transferred to individuals. I mean, it seems to me that at some point along the way, a catastrophic mistake was made, and we should have shared that risk in some way, because employers understandably got out of the market. Um, you referred to earlier, David, some people are just saving far too much for too long against uncertainty. And other people, it's, it's, bewil it's totally bewildering. None of us know how on earth we're supposed to save for our future, and none of us are, are, are accountants. So I, I mean, I, I think I wish somebody would come up with a better solution to that. Um, Nick, your point about people thinking they're a lost cause at 16, I don't know what to say about that. I think, I do think again that GPs have a big role, and I think that I think that the doctors just one of the in all of this area of prevention. Um, Doctors are really trusted. People have heard about five a day forever. They're constantly being told you need to have now seven a day, and then they're being told you can't have a glass of wine. And they, they, they actually, and I know I'm more so in my sugar stuff part of the problem, probably. But I, I do think people are bewildered and they're fed up with being told what to do. And I do think that actually, weirdly, physicians are, and their particular advice to somebody is very trusted. And if we could create more time for that, it would be a good thing, although that's difficult to do. Um, social engagement and loneliness. Um, Julia, I mean, I think you've done a lot of work, you know, on this and with Encore in the States, which is a wonderful organisation, which, you know, gets retired people into non-profits and so on. Um, you know, I mean, there's some stuff on this in my book. I mean, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge question. And one of the big problems is what I call um, tea parties without a purpose. <laughs> you know, we, we're quite good at creating tea parties and inviting yeah. old people to them and old people don't want to go. And the, the projects that I've seen that work are things like Encore, but things that there's a reason to go to the Tea Party. Right? And I think we need to do a bit more of that. Um, sorry, I'm trying to see. Uh, oh, on the um, the planning. Well, Caroline, I mean, you basically, you've sort of, it's like the policy unit. You sit in the policy unit and you say, well, we've got all these interconnected policies and how do we make them work? I mean, this is kind of a nightmare for anyone who ever, ever runs a policy unit. But I mean, on the planning point, um, there's a group of women I interviewed up, up in North London who fought for 18 years to build a building in which they could live together, multi-generational. And one of the reasons that no local authority would support them is because they thought, we don't want anybody over 50 coming here in case they cost us money. So, I mean, that's where we are. Some of those women died before. It's a wonderful building, by the way. But that is a huge issue. Right. And the whole issue of development, the fact that we don't help people to downsize. When I was in number 10, I kept using the word downsizing. And then I realized it was just nobody liked the word downsizing. So they all kind of shut, they all kind of turned mm. off. It was a terrible, so you know, we have to do something about that. Right. Yeah. Sorry if I've left anyone out. No, you're absolutely right. And the plan, it's surprising how little sheltered accommodation and accommodation for older people is now being built in Britain. And uh, on vanishingly small yeah. amounts. And I hadn't yeah. understood, of course, it's the, it's the incentives and effects. It, it's part of the developers and it's yeah. part of the local authorities. Yeah, very interesting. Well, Camilla, that's been fascinating. Here is the book which I recommend and it's uh, as interesting and fascinating as Camilla's interventions this evening. Thank you very much indeed Thank for you. coming along and talking to us. Thanks, Dick.